For the past several weeks, our gospel readings from Matthew have been from what is called the missionary discourse. Jesus is offering instruction to his disciples before sending them out to reach the lost sheep of Israel. He commissioned the twelve to proclaim the coming of the kingdom of heaven and to share God's love with all they encountered. They were to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. In short, they would perform the same signs and acts that Jesus had been doing prior to this point. And in doing so, they should expect to be maligned and persecuted as he was. He was sending them out like sheep in the midst of wolves. And the word of God was a sharp sword that would divide members of a household. But they should have no fear of those who could kill the body and not the soul. For everyone who acknowledged Jesus before others would be acknowledged by him to the Father in heaven. Anyone who found their life would lose it, and anyone who lost their life for his sake would find it. All this brings us to our very short gospel reading that we had this morning. A final wrap-up and pep talk, if you will, at the end of his missionary instructions. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. This statement centers on the idea of identity, the realization of the disciples that as they went about spreading the good news in the land, they represented the one who sent them on their mission. They were ambassadors for the kingdom of God, and anyone who welcomed them were in turn welcoming and serving Jesus. Their mission was not about them as individuals. It was about proclaiming the coming of the kingdom in the name of the one who sent them. Furthermore, anyone who welcomed them and by extension welcomed him would receive their reward in heaven. Welcoming a prophet in the name of a prophet Welcoming the righteous in the name of the righteous, even giving a cup of water to a disciple in the name of a disciple, all of these actions would result in those persons receiving their reward. And the key word here is receive. Christ does not say they would deserve a reward or that through these acts they might earn one. Rather, the reward would be free, an unmerited gift from the hand of God. A reward, if you will, for divine protection, for which 56 men in the summer of 1776 were willing to pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Now, you may not know this, but more than half of the signers of the Declaration of Independence identified themselves as Episcopalians, or rather, more accurately at the time, members of the Church of England. And as you might imagine, the Church of England was not very highly esteemed in the years prior to the Revolution. It was a direct symbol of the nation that the colonists were fighting against, a representative of the British crown, and furthermore, since all Anglican clergy at that point were ordained in England because there was no American bishop, many priests remained loyal to the king due to the oath they had taken upon ordination and the prayers in their common liturgy. There were prayers for the royal family. But recent studies have shown that actually nearly 45% of Anglican clergy in the colonies, as well as a vast majority of the members actually supported the patriot cause. They understood that oaths, liturgies, and governments were subordinate to the commission of Christ. Thirty-two of these Anglican patriots would affix their name on the document 
that declared America as an independent nation, including a Virginia planter and merchant by the name of Thomas Nelson, Jr. Even though he was an established and well-thought-of congregant in the Anglican Church, Nelson was outspoken in his desire for independence from England and fervently believed in the idea of civil and religious liberty for the colonies. In 1775, he was elected a delegate from Virginia to the Second Continental Congress, but his first noteworthy role in the cause for independency happened not in Philadelphia, but rather in Williamsburg. He was attending the Virginia Convention in May of 1776, and Nelson introduced the resolution that instructed the Virginia delegation to propose the idea of independence. Nelson returned to Philadelphia, resolution in his hand, and personally presented it to his fellow Virginian and fellow Anglican, Richard Henry Lee, who would then use it as a basis for his own proposal that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. It was this Lee Resolution, passed on this day in 1776, that officially declared America's independence from Great Britain and gave birth to the new nation. Two days later, this, re, uh, this Lee Resolution would be the centerpiece of the formal Declaration of Independence, a declaration that also professed the new nation's reliance on the protection of divine providence to see them through. For Thomas Nelson, whose health had begun to decline shortly after he signed the declaration, his sacrifices were just beginning. He resigned from Congress and became a brigadier general in the Virginia militia, expending some of his own money to outfit and train his unit. By 1781, he was elected war governor of Virginia and took part in the siege of Yorktown. British officers at the time were using the Nelson homestead as a headquarters, and legend has it that he ordered his troops to shell his own mansion, offering money to the first one who would hit the building. But the war took its toll on Nelson and his health and fortune continued to rapidly decline. His business was ruined because of the war. The large loan he gave to the state to finance war costs was never repaid. And he would die eight years after that siege at Yorktown on the edge of poverty. Thomas Nelson sacrificed everything for the cause of liberty and freedom. And we have no record of anything he might have written or said about his faith. But everything he did appears to have been centered on the commission of Christ above all else. He gave without asking, relying on the grace of God, and said that if he had the chance, he would do it all over again. As a final testament to his actions, his grave marker at Grace Episcopal Church in Yorktown reads, General Thomas Nelson, Jr., Patriot, Soldier, Christian, Gentleman. He gave all for liberty. Countless other men and women in the colonies made these same sacrifices as Nelson. They lost their lives. They lost their fortunes but their sacred honor would never be diminished. They knew the mission would be hard, but they persevered in the face of dire consequences. They put their trust in God, knowing that they couldn't deserve or merit any protection, in the hope, though, that they would receive their reward through God's grace. That is the foundation of this country, the promise of liberty 
life and the pursuit of happiness bestowed as a free gift by the Creator. And for 241 years, we have strived to live up to those ideals. But truth be told, brothers and sisters, we haven't always done a good job at that. The ideals, however, are part of our DNA as Americans and as Christians. And whoever welcomes another in the name of liberty, freedom, and justice will receive their reward. May God bless the United States of America. Amen.